This lecture is an introduction to path analysis. So path analysis is also sometimes called causal modeling, but I typically like to steer clear of that language because while theoretically we might be proposing a causal chain of events or a causal chain of variables, in actuality, we are not testing anything that will give us any defensive or conclusive evidence that there are causal relationships between the variables. It can help us build a case, but it's not going to show or demonstrate or even more strongly prove that there is a causal association between two or more variables. So instead, I typically like to call this path analysis along with many others. And so path analysis really allows us to specify a system of equations that capture theoretical or conceptual models of interest, including more complex ones that have more than one outcome variable, as also models in which an outcome variable is also a predictor variable of another, of another variable itself. And so in this way, we can have intervening variables and we can test mediation processes and things like that within a path analysis framework. And we can do this simultaneously if we use the structural equation modeling approach. Now we can also use this step by step by using multiple linear regression models. And I'll show you briefly how that might be done, but we'll be focusing mostly in this lecture on the structural equation modeling approach where path analysis is a specific application of structural equation modeling. So one of the best places to start when we're talking about path analysis is to talk about the path diagram. Now one of the great things about path analysis is it really lends itself to a visual depiction of the relationships that we're proposing and aiming to test with our path analysis model. And so when we visually depict or create a data visualization to describe our model, we typically call this a path diagram. And I'll show you some conventions as we move along too in terms of how we label things and the type of symbols and notation we use. But let's start first with this. So let's start with a theory or conceptual model of interest. And so this one happens to come from the academic literature and so this comes from the psychology literature. This comes from Asian from 1991, who published the theory or proposed the theory of planned behavior. And the basic idea is this. The behavior is the result of intention by an individual. So if an intention has, or if an individual has greater intention to perform that behavior, then they are then going to be more likely to actually perform whatever behavior that is. Now, in terms of intention, this theory proposes that there's three main predictors or drivers. The person's attitudes towards that behavior, the norms surrounding enactment of that behavior, and a person's sense or feeling of control about being able to perform that behavior. In other words, it's, this is related to their self-efficacy, their confidence in their ability to be able to perform that behavior should they choose to do so. And so here you can see with this conceptual model that we have an intervening variable here or construct, and that is the intention to perform the variable, or intention to perform this behavior right here. And so our ultimate outcome here is behavior, whatever that behavior is that we are trying to predict and explain. And then our, we would call this a mediator variable or intervening variable is our intention variable. And then our predictor variables are our attitudes, norms, and control variables here. And so again, these are the constructs or concepts that are proposed and their theoretical linkages according to the theory of planned behavior here. Now, if we want to draw this theory or conceptual model as a path diagram, we might draw it like this, where here you can see typically we'd use if it's an observed variable or manifest variable, meaning that we've created an overall scale score, or we're just taking the raw data for it. We would call, we typically draw those in rectangles here. And then we would also show the linkages, and this is where you have the unidirectional single-sided arrows here, showing the, the causal flow here, or the proposed causal flow, that, for instance, attitude influences someone's intention, which influences someone's behavior. And then here you see the error terms, or the residual error terms here, which is just like in regression, this is the unexplained variability in this outcome variable here, intention or behavior, um, that is not explained by the predictors of it. Okay, so the error, residual error here for intention represents the unexplained variability or the error after accounting for the variance that's explained by attitude, norms, and control in intention. Whereas with behavior, the residual or error term here reflects the, in this specific case, the um, variance that is unaccounted for and the error in our prediction or explanation of this behavior variable um, after accounting for the effects of the predictor variable intention. 
Now we can also use common notation too, and often we, we can call these structural relations or structural links here. Path coefficients is another very common term that you'll hear in the context of path analysis. And we often can think of these as being just simply regression coefficients, which they essentially are, or they are, exactly are in some cases, especially if we're using the typical step-by-step -step multiple linear regression approach. But again, we'll be focusing on a more of a structural equation modeling approach in this tutorial, meaning that we'll estimate this model simultaneously here and its two constituent um, equations, which I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so let's imagine that we did want to use just a very basic multiple linear regression specification for this model. Well, what we would do first is we would specify one of the equations. And so remember, one of our outcome variables here is intention. And so this would be our um, outcome variable here for our first equation. And the predictors are going to be attitude, norms, and control. And so we'd write out our typical regression linear equation here, where we have our outcome variable intention here on the left side of the equation. And then we have our intercept value. And then our intercept value specifically for intention is the outcome. And then we have our regression coefficients or regression weights for each of the predictor variables here. So B sub one, B sub two, B sub three. Now we would then estimate a second multiple linear regression, or in this case it would actually be a simple linear regression model because we only have a single predictor variable. And that is we'd estimate this equation here, which is behavior being predicted by intention. So the outcome is going to be behavior, the predictor is intention. And so here on the left side of the equation, we have behavior as the outcome that we're trying to predict. And then here we have the intercept value specific to behavior. And then B sub four, the regression weight or regression coefficient for the intention variable here. So that's essentially what we're doing is we would be, if we we're doing multiple step, multiple linear regressions, we could test these in two steps. Now with path analysis though, we can test this all simultaneously if we do it within a structural equation modeling framework. And often we abbreviate structural equation modeling with just SEM. Okay, so let's look at the example for a structural equation modeling um, approach. And so using the SEM approach here, we can actually fit a single model to the data by modeling those equations I just mentioned simultaneously. So it's the same equations, we're just going to estimate them all simultaneously within the same model estimation process. And so what this allows us to do is also set, assess the overall model fit. Because with the multiple linear regression approach, we'd only be able to assess the fit for each one of these models in isolation. Now, another thing to note too, is that with, when we're using a multi, standard traditional multiple linear regression approach, we have models that we would call just identified, meaning that they have zero degrees of freedom, which means essentially we're limited to the fit statistic. And really it's, it's a, a measure of model fit, which is the R squared value. Okay, so that's the percentage of variance explained in the outcome by the predictor or predictor variables in the model. But what this means is we have zero degrees of freedom. And so I'm gonna explain later on in this lecture what I mean by model identification. What does just identified actually mean? But just for now, note that when we'd use the structural equation modeling approach for path analysis, we can actually have a model that can be just identified, under identified, or over identified. And we get to an over identified model. This means we have more than zero degrees of freedom, which allows us to assess the extent to which the model really fits the data. And so this is one of the advantages or another one of the advantages of using the structural equation modeling approach. Okay, so when we focus on just the structural, uh, structural path relations between variables using observed or manifest variables as we're doing here with attitudes, norms, control, intention, and behavior, then we are applying what's a specific form of structural equation modeling called path analysis. I just wanna reiterate that. Pa structural equation modeling is a much larger family of analyses that includes confirmatory factor analysis. It includes things like growth mixture modeling, latent change score modeling, latent growth modeling, and other types of latent variable approaches. We're not focusing on latent variables here, and I won't get into what a latent variable is in this context, um, but that is a whole nother world that you can explore with structural equation modeling. And at the very end of this lecture, I'll provide a couple of resources in case you wanna learn more about the whole universe of structural equation modeling. So let's talk about that idea of model identification I just brought up a second ago. And so, as I mentioned, if you're doing a traditional uh, linear regression model, the model is going to be just identified, which means the degrees of freedom for that model is equal to zero. 
And so what this means is that the number of parameters or paths that you're estimated or that you've specified in your model is equal to the number of unique or non-redundant sources of information. And I'll show you how we calculate this in a second by hand. Fortunately, most software programs will do this for you automatically. Now, the second type of model identification is when we have degrees of freedom that are greater than zero. And this is what we call an over-identified model. And so this means that the number of parameters or paths, um, for example, that we're estimating, and parameters can also include things like the variance components, the covariance components, and those residual error terms. Well, it's when the number of parameters, or which is sometimes called free parameters specified in our model, is less than the number of unique or non-redundant sources of information. And then finally, we have what are called under-identified models, and this is when our degrees of freedom would be less than zero. And so this is when the number of parameters or free parameters specified in our model is greater than the number of unique or non-redundant sources of information. So a model, when we have a just-identified model, just like you would with any linear regression model, it can definitely be estimated, but you're limited in terms of assessing model fit. We can look at R squared, for instance, but we're not going to be able to look at other types of goodness of fit indicators, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. This is where over-identified models come in. So when you have an over-identified model, you can actually assess model fit along a number of model fit indices, again, which we'll cover a little bit later on in this lecture. This also means that you can estimate the model too, so that you can actually find solution or you can actually estimate those parameters in the model. Now, when we get to an under-identified model, this is where the model cannot really be estimated. We're not gonna be able to estimate the standard errors and everything else that we need to actually assess the, the path coefficients and model fit and so forth, because we actually have too many parameters that we're trying to estimate rather to the, uh, compared to the number of sources of unique or non-redundant information that we have access to. So in terms of when I'm talking about model identification, I'm talking about this idea of numbers of unique or non-redundant sources of information. What I'm essentially referring to here is the number of variables that you're specifying in your model and essentially all the possible variances of those, those, um, those variables that you're specifying in the model, including the ones that you're not actually estimate in your model, as well as their covariances too. So there are associations between them. And you can think of a covariance as an unstandardized um, correlation coefficient, just as a variance would be an unstandardized standard deviation, for instance. And so there's actually a simple equation we can use or a simple formula we can use to estimate the number of non-redundant sources of information, the number of unique sources of information in our model. Now, note that we don't need to do this by hand when we're estimating our models, this, I just want to show you how to do this so you kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes. So our model is the product of P times P plus 1 and that numerator over the denominator 2. So P times the sum of P plus 1 all divided by 2. And so P here rec re uh, represents the number of observed or manifest variables that we're trying to model here. So in our case, within our model, we have... Uh, our proposed path model, we have attitudes, norms, control, intention, behavior. So we have five variables there. So P would be equal to five. And so we would use that to calculate the number of non-redundant or unique sources of information in our model. And so again, attitudes, norms, control, intention, behavior, one, two, three, four, five observed or what we sometimes call manifest variables in our, our model here. And so if we plug that into the equation here, or this formula, we get 15. So we have 15 non-redundant sources of information here, 15 unique sources of information with which we can estimate the model. So then that's the first part, okay, for model identification. How many unique sources of information do we have here? The next part is actually the estimating the number of parameters or what is sometimes called free parameters that we're actually attempting to estimate in the model. And now one thing to be aware of is that many of these software programs have defaults. So even if you don't specify certain parameters, it's going to estimate those by default. So for instance, the residual error, the error terms, it will automatically estimate those even if you don't request that at least uh, with software packages, at least the ones I'm familiar with, especially the ones in R, you're going to automatically get your residual error terms as if you're using a structural equation modeling framework. 
Okay, so here is our path diagram again. You'll note that I've added in some other symbols here, and I'll explain what those mean in just a second. So the first thing I want to reinforce that we talked about a brief a bit earlier is when you see the rectangle or the square in these path diagrams, that's conventional symbolism for a manifest or observed variable. In other words, this is the variable that we have. This represents a column in our data set that we are going to be plugging into the model here. Okay, when you see the single-sided directional arrows, this re represents a directional relationship. So here we see the directional relationship between attitude and intention. So you can see that this is there's this implied causality here. Again, this is a theoretical implied causality. It doesn't mean that if we do find that this link is statistically significant, that attitude um, is the causal factor that explains intention. It could be that there's some reverse causality going on here, or it could be there's a third variable we haven't captured that is actually explaining the association between attitude and intention. But theoretically, we're proposing a causal association here. Okay, and this would be theoretically in accordance with the theory of planned behavior. So this would represent one of our path coefficients here. So the next bit of notation here would be what we call exogenous variables. And so we're not really noting this specifically, but we should know what these are. And so an exogenous variable in path analysis or more broadly in structural equation modeling refers to variables where we're not modeling their explicit cause. In other words, they're kind of the end of the road in terms of the predictors. They only predict other things here. They only have directional arrows coming from them towards another variable. Okay, so these are exogenous variables here. Now, when we're talking about exogenous variables, we typically will model the variance of each one of these variables, and the variance is going to be represented by a curved double-headed arc or arrow here, where both ends of this arc, the arrows, are pointing to the same variable. This implies that the, there's variability that's being estimated here. The variance component is going to be estimated. So this is another example of a free of a free parameter or just a parameter. So the arrow, the single-headed arrow, is a parameter, and the variance component is a parameter. Now, a covariance is represented similarly, except it's a double-sided arrow, arc, or just simply, a, it doesn't have to be an arc either. You could represent it by a straight line with double-sided arrows. But it, because one arrow points to one variable and one points to the other, that mean, implies that there's a covari covariation or covariance you're allowing to estimate here between these two variables. So this would be the covariance or the correlation between attitude and control that we're estimating here. Now note, if we didn't include, for instance, this, uh, this covariance here, we're implying that, that there's zero correlation or covariance between attitude and control if we didn't have this double-sided arrow here. The same goes for this. So notice we don't have an arrow drawn from control to behavior in terms of a directional relationship. What this is implying is that we're saying that there is zero association between control and behavior. So when we it actually matters what we don't draw or what we don't specify in our models because those are going to assume, be assumed to be zero. So the next thing that we will do is we will take a look at the ex endogenous variables. So remember, these are the exogenous variables here. These are those variables that we don't model their explicit causes here, and they're only used to predict other variables in the, other mo in the model, and no other variables actually predict them, at least within our model. Endogenous variables are variables that have known or proposed causes within our model here. And so you can see that this is an example of an endogenous variable, intention because the proposed causes are these, attitude, norms, and control variables here. So endogenous variables have directional arrows going to them. Now note that an endogenous variable can also be a predictor variable as well. So, but an endogenous variable cannot be an, an exogenous variable. So in this case, intention is both uh, an endogenous variable and a predictor variable, or you can think of it as being both an outcome variable and a predictor variable in and of itself. And so here you can see that intention is proposed to predict behavior here. Now behavior is only going to be an endogenous variable in kind of the purest sense of the idea here that there, it only has arrows going to it. It's not used to predict anything else. Now for our endogenous variables, because they are being predicted by other variables or there's directional relations that are being drawn to them, 
we need to model the residual error, which is another example of a parameter that's estimated as part of a path analysis. And so this is represented by this notation of the arrow with the circle. And usually you'll also have the same type of variance notation here drawn. And either you'll see an E or a D commonly put here where E represents error. Sometimes these are called residual error terms and sometimes they're called disturbance terms. And so that's why you might see a D here in this circle notation. Okay, so in terms of, we've talked about all the different parameters that we can estimate here. You have the directional paths, you have the residual errors, you have the variance components, and you have the covariance components. Okay, so the next parts, so we've previously we calculated what is the uh, number of unique or non-redundant sources of information in our model, and that was based on the number of variables we have here in the model, which is one, two, three, four, five. We threw that into our formula and found that we have 15 unique sources of information or 15 non-redundant sources of information available in this model. The next thing that we need to do is actually count, is count up the number of parameters, again, which are sometimes called free parameters, that we're specifying in our model. Okay. And these are the decisions that we make here. Okay, So we're saying what is related to what and how. And so let's start here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we count up all the variance and covariance components here between for attitudes, norms, and control, we get six parameters. Let's count up the directional relations here for between attitudes, norms, and control. Okay, So we have parameter seven, eight, nine. And then we have the residual error term for intention, which is parameter 10, the directional relationship between intention behavior, which is parameter 11. And then we have the residual error term for behavior, which is parameter 12. So we have 12 parameters or 12 free parameters that we're specifying in our model here or that we'd like to estimate. So if we take this in conjunction, with the, numbers of with the number of unique source of information that we already calculated, which is 15, and we take 15 minus 12, so the number of unique source of information minus the number of parameters, we get 15 minus 12, which is three, which means that this model that we've specified will have three degrees of freedom, which means that it's over-identified. And because that degrees of freedom is greater than zero, we can actually assess in a more robust way the degree to which the model fits the data and use a number of model fit indices to assess how well our model actually fits the data. Okay, so let's talk about some of those model fit indices here. So again, when we have a model that is over-identified, meaning the degrees of freedom is greater than zero, the fit of the model of the uh, the fit of the model to the data can be assessed using various fit indices. And I'm just going to report some of the most common ones, specifically five of the most common ones that are reported in most structural equation modeling software. And so there's the chi-square test, there's the comparative fit index or CFI, there's the Tucker-Lewis index, TLI, or the root mean square error of approximation or the RMSEA. And then finally, there's the standardized root mean square residual or SRMR. So let's start and dive a little bit deeper into what the chi-square test is actually doing. And we can represent it simply using the, the Greek notation of chi squared um, instead of writing it out if we'd like. So the chi-square test can be used to assess whether the model fits the data, where statistically significant chi-square value, which is going to be evidenced by the associated p-value, is going to indicate that the model does not fit the data well. And a non-significant chi-square value, meaning that the p-value is equal to or greater than 0.05, for instance, would indicate that the model fits the data reasonably well. So the null hypothesis for the chi-square test is that the model fits the data perfectly. And so if we find that the chi-square test value is non-significant, that's indicating that we have no reason we don't have evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the model doesn't fit the data perfectly. So in other words, we can kind of conclude that the model doesn't fit worse than a statistic than a perfectly fitting model. Okay, it doesn't mean it's a perfectly fitting model. It just means it doesn't fit worse than that. Now, if our p-value associated with the chi-square test is less than 0.05, that would mean we would re reject this null hypothesis for the test that the model fits the data perfectly, which would lead us to conclude that, hey, maybe we have evidence here that this model doesn't fit the data very well. It fits worse than a, a, a perfectly fitting model, in other words. Now, the chi-square test is notoriously sensitive to sample size and to non-normal um, variable distributions. And so that's something to consider, especially when you have um, very large sample sizes and so forth. 
that this test is going to be very sensitive to that. So this is why we don't use typically just one model fit index. Instead, we'll use multiple indices to kind of triangulate. It's going to be unlikely that a single that all of these indices will always agree with one another. But we're trying to build a case for our model actually fitting the data adequately or reasonably well. So let's move on to the comparative fit index, which is commonly abbreviated using the acronym CFI. So as the name implies, the comparative fit index or the CFI is a type of comparative or sometimes called incremental fit index or indices. And which this means is that the CFI compares our focal model to a baseline model. And that baseline model is often called the null or the independence model. So we're seeing if it fits better than a model that is essentially empty, okay? Now the CFI is generally less sensitive to sample size in the chi-square test, since this is a good reason why we also report this and use this to, to build our inference that the model actually fits the data reasonably well. And the general rule of thumb is that a CFI value greater than or equal to 0.90 would indicate good fit to the data. So we're really looking for values that are 0.9 or higher. And if we find that, we'd say, okay, we have some evidence here that the model fits the data um, well, that there's good fit to the data. Now, the Tucker-Lewis index, or the TLI, is another type of comparative or incremental fit index, just like the CFI. And so, again, that means that the TLI compares the focal model to a baseline model, which is another way of saying a null or an independence model. The TLI is generally less sensitive to sample size than the chi-square test, and it tends to work well with smaller sample sizes. Now, a TLI value that is greater than or equal to 0.95 is generally the accepted cutoff for indicating good fit to the data. Um, although some people would argue that you could relax that to 0 0.90 um, as an indicator of good fit. Now, in terms of uh, um, absolute fit indices, we can also look at the root mean square error of approximation, which is the RMSEA. And this is, again, it's an absolute fit index, and it's going to penalize for model complexity. So if you're specifying a model that has a lot of different parameters you're trying to estimate, it's going to end up effectively um, giving you a penalty for that. So in a sense, it's trying to reward models that are more parsimonious, that are predicting fewer pathways, fewer variance components, covariance components, and so forth. Okay, so the RMSCA will reward for parsimony. And so this is one of the reasons that we also like to report this. Okay, because we can, if we make a model that is going, that has a ton of parameters in it, and meaning we have very few degrees of freedom left, it typically means that it's going to fit the data better, okay? And, but that doesn't always mean that that's a good thing. That can be just kind of a way to cheat it, and so the RMSEA takes that into account. Now, the RMSEA values tend to be upwardly biased when the model degrees of freedom are fewer, okay? So, and that's just another way to restate what I just said. And typically in terms of the conventional cutoff, an RMSEA value that is less than or equal to 0 0.08 indicates good fit to the data. And then some people will relax that to 0.10 or 0.1 or less, okay? And so for this reason, sometimes the RMSEA and the SRMR, which I'm about to talk about in a second, we sometimes call those um, badness of fit indices. So we're looking at the other end of the spectrum here we're looking at, is this value less than this cutoff as opposed to greater than that cutoff as we did for the CFI and the TLI that I just described. So the last one we're gonna talk about that's also commonly reported is the standardized root mean square residual, which is commonly abbreviated using that acronym SRMR. And so this is another example of an absolute fit index. And so the SRMR value, conventional cutoff that we would use is one that is less than or equal to 0 0.08 would indicate good fit to the data. And there's been some arguments that this one is relatively easy to meet. In many instances, there's been some simulation studies and so forth that have found this is 0 0.08 is probably not um, a super rigorous bar, but it is one that's fairly conventionally used. And um, it's been cited in a paper by Hu, Hugh and Bentler, which is commonly refers to these cutoffs. Now, just like any cutoff, these are, in some sense, always going to be arbitrary. And we should always take these with a grain of salt, and we should keep in mind what their limitations are for each one of these indices that we're using here. But these are fairly conventional cutoffs. And again, we'd want to look across all five of these fit indices, for instance, for instance when we are trying to assess the overall model fit to the data for um, for a model that is over-identified, meaning that the degrees of freedom is greater than zero. And so 
We should use these with caution. We should use good judgment. And again, it's often going to be the case that not all of these five indices, for example, are going to be in agreement with one another. So you kind of use your best human judgment. Um, okay. Do we think we have a case here? And maybe you find that the CFI is 0.89, the TLI is 0.96, the RMSEA is 0.08, the SRMR is 0.08, and your chi-square test is actually statistically significant. So technically there, your, your CFI and your chi-square would indicate that you haven't met that cutoff for um, having good fit to the data. However, because the CFI was reasonably close, and because the chi-square test is known to be very sensitive to sample size, you might say, well, you know, we had three out of five, one was close, and then one is sensitive to sample size, and we had a big sample size. And so again, think about what these different model fit indices mean and try to come up with an uh, at least an argument that these that your, your model does fit the data reasonably well using these. Oh, and one important thing to note is generally if we do find that, let's say that none of these fit indices reach the conventional th uh, thresholds or would be considered indications of good fit to the data. If we find that, that's typically where we stop. We wouldn't go on and interpret the specific directional relations or those parameter estimates, the path coefficients that are being proposed or specified in the model. So first step, look at the model fit to the data. If you find reasonably good model fit to the data, then go ahead and interpret the focal relationships in the model. Um, if not, back up and think about how you've specified the model. It could be that this model is just not a good approximation of what's going on in the data, that the, it's not representing the actual relationships. And so this is why it's good to start with a good, strong theory of what you believe. But sometimes and often is the case, especially in practice, we need to actually reconceptualize and think about um, each pathway, each path, each parameter that we're specifying in our model, does it make sense theoretically and based on our experiences? And then empirically, you're getting either a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the model fit indices here. And so these are things to use as tools to help evaluate and try to come up with a model that is going to best explain or capture the essence of the process or the co proposed causal relationships between the variables you're interested in here. Okay, so um, this is something that we should, it's often an iterative process. The other thing I'll mention too is that sometimes we like to um, have a tendency to over -parameter parameterize the models, which means that, well, we can really improve a fit a lot if we add more and more pathways or covariances and things like that. In actuality, we should only use the ones that we think we really have conceptual or theoretical justification for those specific pathways and to estimate those parameters because otherwise we kind of game the system and we can improve model fit and we can get to a point where we kind of overfit the model where it'll fit this particular sample really well, the data from this sample. But if we try to then generalize the model to another sample from the same population, um, it might not fit the data very well. Okay, in terms of the parameter estimates, this is going to be very similar to your typical linear regression approach. You're going to have your, um, your coefficients, which sometimes might even be labeled regression coefficients, in the output for your structural equation modeling based path analysis. And so this is where you'll get um, those regression coefficients is another word for saying uh, direct relations or path coefficients. You'll also get the covariances and the variances, as well as the residual error components are going to be estimated as well, assuming that you specified the covariances and the variances. And so these can be interpreted like those from a regression model. And so the associated p-values or confidence intervals can be used to determine or use as a way to judge whether or not each of those pathways or parameters is statistically significantly different from zero in terms of its value. Okay, so if you're looking for more or additional resources and you're excited about this idea of not just path analysis, but learning more about structural equation modeling, which again is the big broad family of analyses that introduces an enormous kind of uh, landscape of different directions we can go in terms of modeling um, and in terms of uh, making statistical inference, there's some great resources that I'd recommend. Um, a great book that's very accessible. Um, it's gr very accessible in the sense that it's a great starter book for understanding what structural equation modeling is and the various um, different manifestations of it is one by Rex Klein called The Principles and Practice of Structural Equation Modeling. It's now in its fourth edition as the time of recording this video. Um, very excellent. 
And then there's, if you're looking for more of an applied companion to that book, I do recommend there's a book called Latent Variable Modeling Using R, a step-by-step -step guide by Alexander Bujin or Bujan. And um, this is a really excellent book too. It has your R script, your R code built in. It uses the Levon package from R mainly to for latent variable modeling, which is um, another way of saying structural equation modeling here. So again, both of these resources are really excellent here if you're look, looking to learn more about structural equation modeling. Okay, so that wraps up the lecture on path analysis.